So did you get it? Did you get that gift that you were hoping for? Maybe you've been thinking, you know, it'd really be nice if someone gave me whatever. Maybe you've been hinting at it all year, you know, calling attention to it whenever you saw it on TV or at the store or at a friend's house. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? Maybe you haven't been quite so subtle. Maybe you've clipped the catalog page or advertisement and put it on the refrigerator or sent the Amazon page in a text message or written it in an essay like Ralphie did in A Christmas Story. Now, what did Ralphie want in the movie? Not just a BB gun. He wanted an official Red Ryder carbine action 200 shot range model air rifle. Even though his parents and his teacher and even Santa told him, you'll shoot your eye out. All Ralphie wanted was that one thing. And every time he mentioned it, and he mentioned it a lot throughout the movie, he said it very specifically. I want an official Red Ryder, Ryder uh, carbine action 200 shot range model air rifle. So when it was finally Christmas morning, and Ralphie and his brother tore into their gifts, throwing aside the clothes, after enduring the, the pink bunny outfit, Ralphie was a little disappointed. At the end of the day, his mom asked, did you have a nice Christmas? Yeah, pretty nice. His dad asked him, did you get everything you wanted? Almost. Almost, huh? Well, that's life. Well, there's always next Christmas. And then Ralphie's dad, the old man, sat up and pointed out one last package that was missed. This was his surprise. Ralphie got his official Red Ryder carbine action 200 shot range model air rifle. And even though Ralphie immediately took it outside and nearly shot his eye out, nothing mattered except that he got the one and only thing he really wanted. Now I had one of those Ralphie moments, but it was a little later in my life. It was the Christmas of my senior year in high school. Even though I was 17 and 18 years old, for a year I'd been hinting and talking, even whining about getting a computer at our house, which at the time was not nearly as common among families as it is today. When my family was done that Christmas morning opening our gifts, I'll admit that I was a little disappointed. But then my mom pointed to the dining room table behind me and she said, I think there's something under there you missed. And there was. There was a bunch of boxes that contained all the parts to our family's first home computer. And so I spent the rest of the day ignoring everybody else setting it up. Now, how would you react if you got the one and only thing that you wanted or the one and only thing you need? You'd celebrate, right? Now, maybe you wouldn't throw a party, but you'd probably get right to it and start using it right away. The bigger and better the gift, the more important it is to you, the more you're going to celebrate. That's where we find ourselves with Christmas celebrating the one and only Son of God. Now, all throughout the Bible's history, from the Garden of Eden through the captivity of God's people in uh, Israel in Egypt, uh, their exile in Babylon, through the occupation of Judea by the Romans, God's people had, had been waiting, hinting, begging God to save them. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned and were cast out of the Garden, all of humankind has needed God to save us. And in the birth of Jesus, God has given us his one and only son to save us. And so we celebrate. But we celebrate more than the giving. We celebrate what comes through the gift. We celebrate that holy God has given us what is necessary to make us holy so that we can have a new life an eternal relationship with God himself. So as we finish up this year-long focus on holiness with our celebration of Christmas, we want to make sure that we get it right and celebrate the one and only Son of God. 
Now, throughout the year, we've been defining holiness by the fact that God is perfectly unique in everything that he says and does. So as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is holy, that Jesus is also perfectly unique in everything that he says and does, that he is the one and only Son of God. Now, even though the Apostle John's account of Jesus' life and ministry doesn't include a historical description of Jesus' birth, he does give us a lot to think about when he talks about the coming of Jesus. John writes this in John chapter 1, verses 14 through 18, that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John the Baptist testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Here as John begins the introduction to his gospel account of Jesus' life and ministry, he makes it very clear that Jesus is unique, that Jesus is the real deal, that he is the one and only Son of God. Starting with his description of Jesus' unique identity, John helps us to understand what Jesus came to do and helps us to understand how celebrating God's one and only Son can lead us to holiness. We can celebrate the one and only Son of God when we witness God's glory. As John begins his testimony about Jesus, he tells us that he himself is a witness of God's glory through Jesus. He writes there in verse 14 that the word of God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So as a disciple of Jesus, John had witnessed God's glory in Jesus because the one and only Son of God was born God in the flesh. Now, back in January, we started this focus on holiness with John's description of God's glory from Revelation chapter 4, from a scene in the throne room of God. There before what John describes as four fantastic living creatures, and before the 24 elders who served before the throne of God, everyone in heaven bowed down before God because of the glory of his holiness. The living creature said in Revelation 4, verse 8, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And the 24 elders said in verse 11, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your glory and, and by your will they were created and have their being. Now, sure, when you're standing there in the throne room of God, you would expect to witness the glory of God. But here in the beginning of his account of Jesus' life and ministry, John says that he was a witness of God's glory in Jesus. All throughout the rest of his account, John describes Jesus' preaching and teaching and miracles as they revealed God's glory. John was there. He saw it. He experienced it. Now, while John was an eyewitness to God's glory in Jesus, we are also witnesses to it. First of all, as we read and study the scriptures, the first chapter of John refers to Jesus as the Word. And as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, that's where we're focusing in verse 14, where John tells us that the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We witness God's glory in Jesus, God in the flesh, through the Word of God, the Bible. As we read the Word, we witness, along with John, the glory of God through the one and only Son of God. More than that, as we witness God's glory in Jesus through the Scriptures, we also witness God's glory as we are transformed, not only by what we read, but by the one whom we witness. 
we're transformed when we receive God's grace. John tells us, John 1 verse 16, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. We celebrate the one and only Son of God because through Jesus, we receive God's grace and experience blessing after blessing after blessing. Now, very simply, God's grace is God's favor. To receive God's grace is to find yourself in God's favor. The thought of being in God's favor shows prominently throughout the Christmas story. When the angel told Mary that she would bear the Son of God, he began in Luke 1, verse 28, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. When the angel announced the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, the angel said to them in verse, uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. As God began to reveal his grace to all people through Jesus, we began to experience, as John wrote, one blessing after another. God blessed Mary and the shepherds by taking away their fear, by including them in his plan, by sharing with them the good news of God's favor, and not only for themselves, but for all who would trust him. John tells us in verses 14 and 17 that we have been blessed to receive the truth of God through Jesus. And in verse 18, that, that we have been blessed to know God himself. All this by the grace of God that we receive through his one and only son, Jesus. Like the angel said, this is good news of great joy for all people because we can have a new relationship with God, new life in God's favor by the grace of God. Paul tells us more about these blessings that we receive by God's grace through Jesus, writing in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. The good news is that God loves us. He wants to be with us. He wants to save us. So he sent Jesus to reveal his grace, to offer his grace. So as we witness God's glory, we receive God's grace and we celebrate the one and only Son of God. And in celebrating the one and only Son of God, we also make God known. Now maybe we could think of this as the gift that keeps on giving. I don't know how many of those Christmas-themed TV shows or movies you've seen this season, but most of them try to communicate what they refer to as the real meaning of Christmas. And they're usually referring to some kind of watered-down idea of peace and love and joy, just shy of pointing to God who actually blesses us with those very real things through Jesus. Now, they often try to tell us that, that we need to hold on to this real meaning of Christmas throughout the year. And I think they're right, even if they don't know why. We need to keep the real meaning of Christmas alive all the time, which means we need to make God known all the time. Jesus came to make God known. John writes in John 1, verse 18, that no one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Jesus told his disciples this in John chapter 14, verse 7. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Because he was a witness of Jesus, John wrote all this down to make God known. And he tells us this towards the end of his gospel. In John 20, verse 31, that these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Just as God made himself known, revealing his grace and truth through the coming of Jesus, just as Jesus revealed God through his life and ministry, just as John revealed 
God through his account, we also make God known as we celebrate the one and only Son of God. Now, hopefully, we've been doing that through this Christmas season in our worship services, in our own personal celebrations with friends and family. Hopefully, we've been doing that throughout the year, living our lives in celebration of who Jesus is and what he's done to make us holy through his life, death, and resurrection. Hopefully, we're doing that by sharing the good news with others which is what I want to do right now. Now, those of us who have witnessed God's glory, who, who have received God's grace, know the reason why we celebrate the coming of Jesus at Christmas. But there are still many who don't yet know Jesus, the one and only Son of God. They might be saying, Merry Christmas. And they might have heard the story of Jesus' birth over the last few weeks, but they don't fully understand this is the good news of great joy. That's for all people. A Savior has been born who is Christ the Lord. And if you want to receive the one and only gift you'll ever really need, I invite you to put your faith in Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God who died on the cross to forgive our sins and who rose again to give us new life, if you'll repent and turn back to God, if you'll make it known that Jesus is the Lord of your life, and if you'll join with Jesus by being baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you'll receive that gift by God's grace. You'll be forgiven of your sins, and God the Holy Spirit will come and live within you to help you live this new life. Now, if you're ready to make that decision, or if you've got any questions about what I've been saying, I invite you to contact me at Athens Church of Christ and we'll get together as soon as possible and work through all of that together. But until then, please let me pray for you. Father God, I praise you for your holiness, for your plan to make us holy through your one and only Son, Jesus. As we celebrate the birth of Jesus, I, I pray that we would make you known, that we would be witnesses of your glory that we would help others receive your grace and forgiveness through Jesus. And right now, I pray for those who have not yet put their faith in Jesus, that you would lead them to yourself by your Holy Spirit and through your word and with the help of your people, the church. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.